in a way it's a mirror I don't know if you've noticed that in your relationships but how your sexuality goes in a particular day or week or whatever is pretty much a reflection of the rest of your heart and mind and spirit and being it's in that regard it's just like meditation you sit down and close your eyes and what do you get you get to see basically what's there if you're frustrated or angry or happy or in love that's what shows itself and sexuality serves the same way physically but even more so emotionally Hey there, welcome back, Heart Wisdom fam. This is once again Ganesh Braymiller, Jack's media manager, content specialist, and cordyceps sipping elephant, here to open the door to a rather juicy one, episode 191, Spirituality and Sexuality. Now, last week, we put out a talk Jack did back in the 80s, just after the passing of Chogim Trumpa. It spoke eloquently of the jewel of the Dharma, which Rinpoche so boldly planted in the West, but it didn't fully brush on the stains of abuse and misconduct, which also came bundled in the Trumpa package. This is crucial to point out that we are not accepting or forgiving Trumpa's actions, but we do bow to what he was able to do for helping spread Tibetan Buddhism and mindfulness teaching in the West. There's something important here about separating the teachings from the teachers and not throwing the Buddha out with the bathwater. Now, personally, I actually had a teacher in India who I was holding in very high esteem, and he performed misconduct, and it threw me. I had a photo of him on my puja table, I had taken mantra from him and learned practices from him. The whole thing put a bad taste in my mouth around my entire practice for a while. That was until I remember Jack's story about Ajahn Chah and how he was represented as enlightened by the entire monastery. But Jack's discriminating Western mind saw Ajahn Chah bumbling around, reading the paper, eating mindlessly, uh, giving back and forth advice, the whole nine. So finally, he went up to Ajahn Shah and spilled the beans. Hey, man, I don't, I don't think you're enlightened. I've been watching you, and I don't see it. And Ajahn Shah said something so wise and mind-stopping to the likes of, thank God, phew, thank God you don't see me as enlightened, because then you would think enlightenment is somewhere outside of yourself, outside of your own heart. Ooh, that's good, right? Now, for me, finding out what my teacher in India did I don't associate with him anymore, but his actions no longer affect my personal practice or my view on the teachings. So, in this episode, knowing it was recorded in the early 80s, recognize that a comment or two from Jack may feel of that era. But for the most part, this unique and vulnerable Dharma talk helps offer nuanced perspectives on ways to harmonize two of the most important parts of our lives, spirituality and sexuality. With this topic being taboo in spiritual circles, I felt drawn to select this episode because it's certainly a subject which hasn't been fully fleshed out here, so to speak. Um, And having said that, I was a bit nervous about potential feedback and even about creating this opening monologue. But I remembered that one of the main reasons I love Ramdas so much, Ramdas being the namesake of this Be Here Now network, is because of his unabridged vulnerability, realness, and openness about his form, fallibilities, quirks, desires, mistakes, and humanness. In this spirit, I truly think the more we can normalize being human, never normalizing abuse or misconduct, that's a whole other thing, but normalizing being open about what it's like for us to be deeply loving spiritual beings steering around these fleshy human bodies with all these unique desires and soul yearnings for connection and wholeness. The more we establish this, the more we can bring to light much of our personal and collective shadows to help heal ourselves and others and overall normalize being human. So before setting sail on the sea of spirituality and sexuality, I have some awesome Jack events and courses to share with you. June 12th starts the new power of awareness. Jack and Tara welcome two celebrated senior teachers, Devin Berry and Conda Mason, to offer new training and a deepened commitment to engage spirituality, equity, and cultural sensitivity. And this one's really exciting too, y'all. We are turning one of Jack's favorite and most helpful online courses on jackcornerfield.com, Buddhist Psychology, into a live offering. Sign up for the live version. Uh, it will begin on July 6th. And with your enrollment, you will receive two live online group question and answer sessions with Jack. 
Find this and more on jackhornfield.com. And if you're looking to engage with digital Sangha, I implore you to look into Tara Brock's and Jack's brainchild, Cloud Sangha, who can help you find groups of other spiritual seekers of whatever flavor you're looking for. Find your digital spiritual community at cloudsangha.co. So there we go, fam. Let's draw the blinds, light a candle, turn on some nice music, and relax into Heart Wisdom episode 191, Spirituality and Sexuality. May you be safe. May you live in truth and bliss. May you be abundant, and may you help the world through the authenticity of your own being. Namaste, y'all. Explore a topic that is not particularly Buddhist, but I think very dharmic and very uh, essential in a way for most of our lives. And that is to explore the relationship of spirituality and sexuality. Um, You have to understand also that I am basically a novice at this, as we all are. So it is really an exploration, and it's a reflection from a number of different points of view that's intended more than anything else just to get myself and the rest of you who listen, to begin to look at sexuality as a part of practice, to begin to look at our relationship to it and see if it's wise or compassionate or fearful or addictive or just to begin to understand its power. Um, My interest in it Uh, has certainly been, as for many people, um, over a lot of years. And I remember even being a monk, one of the reasons that I came back and didn't remain in robes for the rest of my life was a real desire for relationships. And, And it was kind of mixed up with just plain lust and sexuality, and some of it on a much deeper level, wanting to connect with a woman and have relationships. But I remember going out on alms round, you were supposed to kind of look down and be very decorous and kind of receive things in silence, which I did. I was I was pretty good monk, but once in a while, <laughs> walk through villages and there would be the most, some of the Thai girls in the villages were like, Davis, like angels, and there I would be very piously walking through the village with my begging bowl, and the most beautiful girl would come out, and I would notice that my thoughts changed. (laughs) (laughs) I became a lot less interested in the mango or the rice or whatever. (laughs) So, I mean, it was there all the time, but what was interesting when I returned after being in Asia for, oh, five or six years at the first time, came back, I guess I was 26 or something like that, or 25, was I found an an interesting phenomena that I basically started exactly where I left off. And this is an important thing to discover in one's spiritual practice, an important principle, that if one goes off to a retreat or goes to some far-off place, I had a cousin, a young girl, who went traveling and at the age of 17 or 18 was in Israel and met a young man and married him there and lived on a kibbutz and had two children, lived there for about 10 or 11 years, came back to this country and got divorced, had a difficult time, and then she was about age 28. And as she started to date and and go out with other men, she was immediately catapulted back to 17 years old because that's when she had left. And she'd done other things in her life, but her sexuality hadn't caught up to her at all. It's not just sexuality, but it's really understanding that we, we have to bring our attention to some area for it to develop. So I came back, um, no wiser than when I left after a lot of meditation and I understood a lot of things but sexuality was still pretty much in the dark for me and I got into a series of relationships that were pretty much the same kind as before I would left which weren't terribly conscious and 
um, in which I used them a lot just because I was lonely. Loneliness figured a lot more into it than, than any other power. But I began to wrestle with it and try to understand it. And it was not very quick. It took a lot of practice and a lot of mistakes in, in many ways. Um, and it got more interesting as I paid more attention. Hopefully the talk will be a bit interesting, too. If, it, if it's really dull and it's on sexuality, something is wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> but why is it... I mean, if you look at our culture, if you look at uh, television and the kind of mass media and stuff, it's such a big part of it. And it's, it's so obvious in our culture. Why is it such a big thing? Or why is it a big thing in many of our lives? I think in part because it's a vehicle to go beyond ourselves. And even though it's impossible in some ways, as Suzuki Roshi says, even though it's impossible to go beyond ourselves, still we really try in every way we can. And it is possible, actually, but, but it seems in certain ways impossible. Here we are bound in this, or, or identified with this physical body. But there's some place in us that wants to escape, <laughs> that wants to get bigger, that wants to touch something beyond just me and moi and mine and all of that stuff. Remember the, the Nasruddin story I told last month here when he was looking for his perfect wife? Someone asked if he would get married, and he said he tried. He found this very spiritual woman in Baghdad and this beautiful and uh, very uh, sensuous woman in Cairo, and, but they didn't get along in some other ways. And finally he found the perfect woman in, in uh, Lebanon somewhere. She was beautiful and, and uh, worldly and intelligent and spiritual and gracious, just the perfect wife. And the friend said, well, why didn't you marry her? And he said, well, unfortunately, she was looking for the perfect husband. <laughs> and we seek something. I mean, we, and we keep doing it over and over, you may have noticed, at least most of us. We're looking for something. But what I saw in myself and in many other people who ordained was that sexuality was really scary that the level of intimacy and the kinds of opening that it took, um, it was easier to be a monk for, for a lot of people. And Buddhism talks a lot about selflessness, about discovering that we don't own or possess this body or thoughts or feelings or mind, that it's all a process. There's a lot spoken about shunyata and emptiness and selflessness. And in some ways it puts so much emphasis on that, that a whole other piece of practice is missing, which is the development of ourself as much as the loss of ourself. In fact, one psychologist at Harvard, Jack Engler, who did a lot of research on this and is also a Vipassana teacher, he put it very simply. He said, you need to have a self before you can lose it. And I think it's a little too simplistic because, in fact, those are two simultaneous tasks that we have. One of the development of a sense of wholeness and, and wellness and well-being and integrity. And the other, through our practice in our life, being able to let go, to let that self die and be reborn again and again many times. It's as Kalu Rinpoche says, you live in illusion and the appearance of things. There is a reality, but you do not know this. You are that reality. And when you understand this, you will see that you are nothing. Being nothing, you are everything. That's all. Very simple kind of summary of Buddha Dharma. You are nothing. And discovering that, you find you're connected with everything. Well, how does one get connected through sexuality? I mean, that seems to be what it's about in some ways, our desire to be connected. And one Zen master, Suzaki Roshi, teaches, his whole teaching is oriented around two numbers, zero and one. Zero means emptiness, and one means union or connection with in the world of form. Um, and he makes very simple koans in the beginning that you work with. 
How do you manifest or realize Buddha while looking at a tree or hearing a bird sing? Which means to say, how do you listen to that bird and come into union with it? Lose this sense of self. I know it very well because every time I went in to try and answer that koan, in the beginning he would just shake his head and ring his bell to send me out and say things like, too much self and, or too much ego and send me back out to try and answer it again. But there was a session that Sasaki Roshi led one year that a couple of friends of mine attended, a number of people, and two of the people that were there were students of his who were having a lot of marital difficulties and some sexual difficulties. And as the retreat went on, the seven days, they looked better and better and happier and happier. So this mutual friend of ours said she was sitting there watching and said, gee, they must be having really deep meditation. It must be going very well for them in the retreat. And afterwards, she spoke with him, and it turned out that the koan that Sasaki Roshi had given them was to go and make love four times a day <laughs> and to answer a koan about how do you realize Buddha while making love. And they both had to come in together to Sanzen, which is kind of unusual in, in Zen practice. And he would, you know, say, what's your koan? And they'd recite back, how do you manifest or realize Buddha while making love? And they had to answer it. I don't know if they got the answer, but they looked great by the end of the retreat. <laughs> In a way, it's a koan for all of us right? to understand how to make sexuality a part of our practice. And it, it's so powerful in the USA. If you come back here from some other culture like India, where it's kind of downplayed, and you arrive in the airport in Los Angeles, it just blows your mind. I mean, the things people wear and strut around in, and the advertising, and just the vibe, it's real powerful. Not to say it's good or bad, but we're a culture that really, the pheromones and all the stuff, the juices go on a lot in our culture. Now, how can we understand this? How can we learn to be aware of it? Because it can be a whole kind of realm that, that is ignored in spiritual practice. Well, I can follow my breath good, and I'm okay when it comes to uh, you know, uh, generosity or something like that. But how about your relationships, and how about your sexuality? Let's talk about it on some different levels, taking the four foundations of mindfulness. Again, this is a little sacrilegious, but it seems appropriate somehow. The first is the physical, or, or let's put it more obviously, the biological. We are animals. We forget it sometimes in our busyness of the day, and you know, doing income taxes and writing letters and watching television and so forth. But that's how it goes. You know, you come in by being born through a vagina, through uh, intercourse, through somebody's womb, and you feed yourself. We all do. Have this hole in here that we put in dead plants and animals and mush them up, right? And <laughs> swallow them, and our body burns them just the way any other animal does. And we have a little bit of fur, and we're kind of like a... I don't know, we have the same life cycle, we're born little and we grow up and we get older and then we get aged and then we die, like trees and like plants and flowers and, and uh, every other kind of animal. And like all the other animals, we have a sexual aspect, we all have genitals. They're weird, they are, but our whole body is very weird. Did, did you never have that moment in intercourse? where you thought, I mean, not to say that it wasn't pleasant, but this is really pretty strange. <laughs> did, did that ever happen to you? It must have. You're all laughing. Of course it did. <laughs> and so there's something that's necessary to have some humor about being incarnated in this physical form. We are not this body. Sometimes you get glimpses of that as well. But we get it to use, and it's very strange. You, you feed it, and you jog it, and you wash it, and you do all those things, and you, you know, you make love with it sometimes, if you like, or if you're fortunate, or whatever, depending how it goes. But we forget that. 
we forget this, this amazing thing. It's the same kind of forgetting that forgets that we're going to die. Where it says in the, in the Mahabharata or in the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna was asked by Arjuna, what's the most amazing thing on this earth? And the, the god Krishna answered, the most amazing thing is that people can see others dying all around them and think that it won't happen to them. From Lewis Thomas, the biologist, he says that the obituary pages, pages tell us of the, the fact that we're dying away while our replacements, in smaller print on the side of the page, inform us of our replacements. But through this we get no grasp of the scale of it. There are five billion of us on this earth, and all five billion must be dead with, on schedule within this lifetime. In less than half a century, we will have more than doubled the numbers. That's a lot of sex happening, among <laughs> other things, and a lot of birth. Something over 75 million of us die each year. We, will ha we get no grasp of this scale, and we will have to learn to look at this in some other way and to stop seeing it as a catastrophe or a disaster or even unnatural. With so many of us doing the dying, it's getting hard to keep the secret. <laughs> it's true. Birth, death, eating, walking, defecating, urinating, it's all. We are animals. We get to be an animal for a while. It's an interesting thing to be, don't you think? And when we don't connect with the biological level in some way, again... There's a tremendous amount of blindness and the loss of awareness and uh, a kind of sadness because we cut ourselves off from some part of what's our richness in this life, what we get to learn from. So the first part on this level is just to raise some questions for ourselves. What is our conditioning around being biological, being an animal? What is our conditioning about sexuality? per se, or eating for that matter. Is it good? Is it bad? We have very powerful conditioning around sexuality. Think about what your parents, not what they said, you can think about that for a moment, but more what they didn't say. Or what kind of messages did you get when you grew up about sexuality? Or about th this body, about being in a body. For some people, there's shame or embarrassment. For others, there's a sense of delight or exploration, discovering what it means to, to be in a physical body or using it to awaken or share or for pleasure. For some people, there's embarrassment even about being in a body at all, being born. If you really look deeply, how did I get myself into this? Ugh! <laughs> you laugh, but it's very painful and it's not uncommon at all. There's big areas where we don't accept the facts of life, so to speak, or being a woman, or being a man. And it's very useful to begin to look into this to ourselves. How do we feel about being in a woman's body or in a man's body? Do we love it? Do we hate it? Is it something we kind of put up with, hoping for something better next time or whatever? That's the biological level. I could go more into it. It's very important to begin to relate to. And you can look at the, there's a wonderful book that was done of the sexual behavior of animals in pictures with very little words. It just showed rhinoceroses doing it and crabs doing it and whales doing it and ducks doing it and uh, cows doing it and praying mantis is doing it and it's an amazing book to look through somewhere in the middle there is people doing it they're just another page in this whole long list of it this amazing thing the biological level for me it was a great transformation when we decided to have a baby 
because prior to that, sexuality had been all the different things that it could be. Sometimes it was just mixed with loneliness or other times with trying to connect with someone. Um, sometimes it, it was very beautiful. But it had never been connected with this very interesting thing, which is making children, which it is at least primarily designed for. Obviously, for humans, it has various purposes. I mean, it was an extraordinary thing for just in my own life to change one day and say, let's do it for this other reason, as well as the various other ones that one does it for. It was fantastic, actually. It was quite a wonderful experience. And that connected me as well as watching my wife become pregnant. That's weird, you know. It's pretty strange to have another person grow in there and then being there for the whole birth process. Here's this person coming out of another. That's how we make more of ourselves. Fantastic. So there's coming to terms with that in ourselves. And I just leave it for you as something to reflect on. Then there are the emotional levels of sexuality. There's the biological, there's the emotional. Sexuality can be associated or connected with so much in our lives. It can be a place of addiction. It can be a place to love. It can be a place of healing. How many kinds of, of healing and woundedness are there for many people around sexuality? Rape and, and sexual abuse, incest of different kinds. Not small numbers, but millions of people in our culture, probably around the world. Or, or just rejection just feeling not okay about oneself or having experiences around sexuality that are really traumatic. So it can be a place of great pain. It can be a place of pleasure. It can be a place of great healing. In a way, it's a mirror. I don't know if you've noticed that in your relationships, but how your sexuality goes in a particular day or week or whatever is pretty much a reflection of the rest of your heart and mind and spirit and being. It's, in that regard, it's just like meditation. You sit down and close your eyes, and what do you get? You get to see basically what's there. If you're frustrated or angry or happy or in love, that's what shows itself. And sexuality serves the same way, physically but even more so emotionally. Now, one might ask, how is it treated or regarded in Buddhism? And there, there are a lot of different ways it's regarded because, again, it's a mirror. In the monastic and the very disciplined Buddhism of um, Theravada, traditional Theravada Buddhism, mostly taught through monasteries, um, the first basic thing is the teaching of the precepts, that it's a, an activity of human life and that you try to learn to engage in it in ways that don't harm other beings. That's the precept of refraining from sexual misconduct. Boy, if we could learn that one in our culture, it would, it would really make a big difference. That would be the end of rape and incest and sexual abuse and exploitation and so forth. To not act out of our own greed or desire or need in ways that harm another person. That's kind of the baseline teaching. But what's interesting as well with that is that on this level of the monastic and, and the kind of traditional uh, renunciate teachings about sexuality, it's also kind of feared or condemned. And there are exercises for monks in part just to help them to free themselves from their sexuality because they're not allowed to act on it. But they involve visualizing your desired partner and then starting to look at all the excretions that come out of all the different holes in the body until you change from desire to repulsion. And one forest teacher that I met in my travels talked about women's breasts as being like the horns on some animal that could spear you, so you had to watch out. It was sort of like, take care, this is very dangerous territory. Well, it is dangerous in a way, but not exactly as he understood it. When Mahasi Sayadaw, who was a very great Burmese teacher, came to this country, 
and was asked about sexuality in one retreat he gave. Um, the translator, after some giggling, because no one would ask monks about that in Asia much, said that, that uh, sexuality was gross, base, and disgusting. So the sort of the monastic get rid of it and sort of our animal nature is something to be condemned in some way. Um, I remembered something I have to talk about. Well, there was fortunately some women there who had questions for him to kind of begin to educate him a little bit, men as well. And one who had a very good sense of humor, and after he left, it was actually at Dharma Follies that year at, at IMS, which we do once a year so that we don't take ourselves too seriously. And she came out and did some imitation of that talk and spoke of how sexuality was engro engrossing, basic, and worth discussing. <laughs> <laughs> instead of gross space and disgusting. So this is one way Buddhism treats it. It's dangerous, don't get involved, and the teachings in the sutras, somebody asked the Buddha, Ananda, or somebody, what should we do about women, us monks? And he said, don't look at them. And they said, well, what if they come into your view? Well, then don't talk to them. Well, well what if you have to talk to them? then at least be very mindful. It's sort of like there's something dangerous about it. That's one set of views. And also for householders to take care with, with basic precepts. Then, if you go to other aspects of Buddhism, more the teachings for householders and the spirit of the bodhisattva path, if you will, and more emphasized in Mahayana Buddhism. But it's true in, in Theravada as well. Sexuality is actually seen as neutral. Rather than bad, it's a very powerful but neutral energy. And in one way, it can be associated with greed, with exploitation, with fear, with um, grasping, with aggression. And we've all seen ourselves do that at times. Anyone who hasn't, please raise your hand. On the other, that same energy can be associated with intimacy, with communion, with love, with caring, with something that's very, very positive. And so what becomes important then is not the sexuality itself, but what is the intention? What, how do we associate with it? How do we use that aspect of our being? Is it used in an exploitive way, or is it used in a way to touch someone else, to open for intimacy, for an expression of love or caring? Is it a place that we can find joy in it? We can make it anything. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It can turn into anything. It can be a nightmare or something wonderful. There's a story of Mullah Nasruddin. He was running an inn one day, his village, and the great imperial majesty, the grand emperor, Shah and Shah or whatever, came through town with his retinue, and it was breakfast, and they stopped there. And for himself and his five closest advisors, uh, they served breakfast, which was just uh, eggs cooked up in a, in a lovely way and served to his majesty. And it was done, and his majesty said, or the... The, his vizier there, his advisor, said, well, how much will that be for those uh, five plates of eggs? And Nasruddin said, that will be a thousand gold pieces apiece, five thousand gold pieces. And his majesty looked back and said, gee, it seemed like, seems like eggs must be very rare in these parts. And Nasruddin answered, not eggs, sire, but the visits of shahs are rare the visits of your majesty. We can make it into something valuable, into something exquisite, into something that's terrible or that's painful. Not only can we, we do at different times. And so this teaching is really the teaching of beginning to bring our awareness to the intention, to the state of our heart and our being that activates, that informs us. That becomes much more useful to us. It also requires a distinction between attachment and, uh, or non-attachment and commitment in relationships. Here it's not just non-harming, 
but it's really using relationships in a skillful way to grow. I've talked about this in other evenings, but it's possible through a misperception of spiritual teachings to say, well, I'm not attached, I don't care anyway. Um, this relationship, that one, closed marriage, open marriage, uh, divorce, another marriage, it all doesn't really matter because you're not attached. It's all just a dance of light and shadow, right? And that can be an excuse for or a cover for our fear or for indulgence or for greed or all kinds of things. Non-attachment does not mean lack of commitment. And in fact, to learn in relationships with people requires the same kind of caring and commitment that uh, sitting on a zafu does. If you get up from your sitting, every time it hurts a little bit or you're a little restless or bored, how far will you get in your meditation? Not very far. And if we, if we back out of a relationship, and I'm not saying there aren't times to end it or times for divorce, but if we do it every time it gets difficult because we're in it for the pleasure, we might as well give up. Not even sex gives pleasure all the time. Have you noticed? And so what's required is a different vision that it's a place to learn to love or to commit oneself to opening or growing or discovering or, or developing generosity or kindness in a deeper way. Then it becomes a pretty interesting game. Now there's another level of spiritual relationship to it that's found in Buddhism and elsewhere, which really sees it as positive, that tries to use it for awakening. And that's the more tantric approach. And don't ask me to teach much about it because I don't know much about it, but I know a little bit. And it's true that there is sexual tantra, not to speak of the other most more important or, or greater meanings of tantra, which is just transformation of emotional energy and transformation of physical energy. But there's a specific teaching of sexual tantra as well, and there are lamas who have consorts and live in caves in the Himalayas still and do various practices. Why, how, how can one understand this? It's actually not so difficult, and most people do in an intuitive way. There's something tremendously powerful about sexuality. What makes it so powerful? One thing is that it's a place of natural samadhi. We work so hard to follow our breath, you know, or walking meditation. If you're lucky, you get a little concentrated and some light or peace or something comes out of it. But here's a way that that sense of collectedness comes naturally. One of the few places in our lives that it comes. Maybe a death is another one. And it's fantastic to be concentrated, to not not be so afraid or, or thinking or planning or remembering. It's a place where finally the body and mind come together for a bit. And it tells you of how powerful it is to get concentrated. So that's one reason. It's the natural samadhi of it. Another place, another aspect of it, is it's a place of surrender, of going beyond ourselves. It's fantastic. Finally, at least for a moment or a few minutes or whatever it is, we can let go a little bit of being kind of locked in this body, in this mind and set of self-images, and surrender and touch something outside of ourselves. And it's fantastic. The word for orgasm in French is petit mot, is a little death. It's like you get to die, which is wonderful. Death isn't so bad, actually. It can be great, in fact. We get to let go. And there's such a powerful allure to that moment that, like many things, we get addicted, we'll do anything for that. But it's possible to use that power to let go, to surrender, to open to something greater, to make it meditative. If you want a couple of hints about it, one of the beginnings of sexual tantra is to sit with another person or be with another, lie with another person in a state of some arousal and begin to follow each other's breaths, to synchronize breaths. Without doing anything else, take 10 minutes or 15 minutes where you just synchronize your breathing. 
and stay with that and see what happens. How many of you know the ah breath that Stephen Levine uses in his uh, death and dying workshops? A few. Maybe I'll do that some night here because it's very wonderful and powerful. It's where people pair off and they follow the breath of the other person and make a sound in doing it. And there's a kind of intimacy that comes simply in connecting through the breath that's really astonishing. In fact, he's a bit careful in his workshops who pairs up with who, just because that kind of intimacy can be, can be really surprising. Here's an ad for sexual tantra seminars. <laughs> tantra is the use of sexual energy to experience higher states of consciousness. This means not only the classical enlightenment spaces, but feeling better about ourselves, handling our depressions and fears and our sexual dysfunctions. Students also become magnetic so that attracting the right partner becomes easier. I'll post it at the end here for anyone who's interested. <laughs> now what's interesting is that there's a place in practice where this opens up for everybody. And you can sit, there are openings of the chakras that happen rather naturally. And at some time, the sexual center opens. You're just sitting, following your breath, and minding your own business. There's a friend of mine who's a psychologist who was at a retreat last year, a woman. And she came in to me for an interview one day, and she said, I just cannot believe it. She said, first started rapture, and then it was like orgasm after orgasm. She said, I was trying to sit there and be kind of cool with all these people around. <laughs> but then the visions came, she said, and all I could see was myself lying there on the podium, kind of in front of everybody, and being taken by every species of being that existed. And I walk outside and look at the, it was in the desert, at the cactuses, and I see the flowers, and I see cactuses making love, and rabbits making love, and all the life around, even in this sparse desert, all I see is just this, the whole cosmos is this big machine, or not, but this big force of sexuality, of, of union, of coming together and separating, coming together and separating, of zero and one again and again. And there are places in practice, you don't have to look for them, but at times that opens up. Very powerful. It's interesting, actually. It's wonderful. That begins, if you, if you don't say, oh, it's bad or, or repress it, it actually begins to force somebody, even if they haven't prior to it, to, begin, to relate to this energy as, a, as much a part of ourselves as anything else in the world. So there are all these different ways that it's looked at in spiritual practice, as neutral or as bad or as actually something skillful. What way do you use it for? How do you choose to work with it? Look at your own life. We, it's, it's really worthwhile to reflect on it. For a lot of people, it's also associated with addiction. You know, and our culture has a lot of addiction. It's not just cocaine and alcoholism and heroin and stuff like that, 20 million alcoholics and 10 million drug addicts. But it's television addiction, or it's addiction to shopping and to consumerism. And, um, and what is the source of all of this addiction, there being so much of it? What is this hole in us, this hunger? And, and if you pay attention inside, you find there are different holes. There are genital holes. There are holes where you feel like you, you need to be filled that way. And there are holes in the heart where you feel maybe you were not held or loved or something when you were little or some past life. I don't know where the conditioning comes from, but it's true for a lot of us. And we're hungry, as Mother Teresa said, not for food, but hungry for something that's hungry for love or for spirituality. And they get a little bit mixed up, those holes. Have you noticed? You know, and so some people eat. I think this is, is going to fulfill that one, you know. Or you go out and you use the sex as some way to, to fill your hungry heart. That's not bad, particularly, but it's kind of good to pay attention and find out where you're really hungry and what it is that you're really looking for. It helps to, to heal that, to ease that, to, to bring that into a kind of a wholeness. 
And so then this leads to a whole other level of looking at it. There's the biological, the animal level, which I think is quite interesting and wonderful. And then there's the emotional level and looking at what emotions and intentions are associated. And then there's the interpersonal levels of love and sexuality. There are so many meanings for the word love. We, in other languages, they have lots of other words for it. There's three or six in Hungarian and seven in Russian, but on English, it's love. And you know, I love ice cream. There's that one kind of love. Or the businessman's love. I'll get you off if you get me off, you know, or I'll take care of you if you take care of me, which is okay, but it's pretty limited after a while. There's erotic love. I and mean, we could spend the evening just talking about eros and, and, and the erotic. And again, in spirituality, because body and mind and spirit are disconnected, and a lot of Buddhist, Christian, doesn't matter, a lot of spiritual traditions work and say, the spirit is here and matter is down there. Sex is sinful. All the kind of conditioning we got in our churches and our schools. My own experience is that that's not so. That the only thing that will heal this earth and the damage that we've done to it and heal our bodies and ourselves is to not split things off, not to make sexuality another part of our shadow, like aggression is, but really to incorporate it and say this too. And that means even if someone's a renunciate, a monk or a nun, which is a beautiful way to choose, to do it, not out of fear or out of disgust, but out of choosing something rather than out of rejecting it. So there's ice cream, I love ice cream, or I'll love you if you love me. There's erotic love, all the, I mean, our culture is masterful in a very crude way at Eros. It doesn't have the kind of subtleties of Chinese or, or Indian kind of erotic stuff so much. But it's got pornography and, and um, advertising and things that try to keep the, the stimulation level going all the time. How do we relate to that? Is that good? Is it bad? Do you like the erotic? I like it, mostly. Depends what kind. Then there's romantic love, which can also be a disaster for people. There's a really good explanation of romantic love in a book called We, sort of a, a Jungian viewpoint of it by Robert Johnson, these three books he wrote of he, she, and we. And we is a, a story of the myth of Tristan and Isolde um, and talks about the history of romantic love and how it's both beautiful in our culture for the last 500 years or so, but how it keeps us from relating truthfully as people from one to another. And then there's universal love, doing loving kindness or compassion meditation for all beings. But that's very different than quite personal love, isn't it? And if you have only the universal, my friends, you're in trouble. You can look at it yourself, but that's what I found. It's a beautiful state to kind of love all things. But if you can't also love the things nearest to you in a personal way... It gets very detached and very dry and somehow more idealistic than real, than genuine. And for me, in playing with all these different levels of loving ice cream to loving a, a child or another person, somehow there's a possibility of the bringing together of those, of what's universal and what's personal. And then there are all the roles we take in sexuality. We can be the courtesan, or we can be the victim, or we can be use it for Don Juan, or we can use it for power in certain ways, or, you know, to feel good about ourselves, or be afraid of it, or withhold it. Anybody ever seen themselves do that? And how much projection there is around it. How much we imagine and project on other people. That's really our own issues about it. So these are all things to begin to explore. 
Let yourself play with it. Really let yourself start to ask questions. What areas are you not mindful? What areas are you afraid of? What is your conditioning about living in a body or about having genitals or about being a woman or a man? Where have you been wounded? What in your sexuality needs healing? How can you use it to open more, to be freer, to be fuller, to live more wisely and more compassionately? All of those things, let it be a part of the practice.